you mentioned, I work with the uh, USDA Agriculture Research Service. And so before I start talking about psyllids and uh, microbes, maybe not everyone is uh, familiar with the Agriculture Research Service, so I thought I'd just put a pitch here about what we are and uh, you know, what we do. So uh, the ARS is the USDA's chief in-house scientific research agency. Uh, it's actually a, a pretty large agency, uh, a lot of scientists all over the country. Uh, the ARS conducts research primarily in four uh, national programs. One that has to do with nutrition, another has to do with animal production and uh, health, another that has to do with natural resources uh, and sustainable agriculture. And then the national program that I am part of, uh, Crop Production and Protection. And uh, one of the major goals of my national program is to, or one of the goals, is to come up with uh, uh, novel ways to control pests that, uh, that we have that challenge uh, agriculture. So, um, so that is part of my job is to come up with uh, you know uh, information and new technology to control insect pests. Um, I'm located at the uh, Yakima Agricultural Research Laboratory. We do, there's nine scientists there. We do research on uh, pests of tree fruits and pests of uh, vegetables. And actually, we only re really do research on one vegetable, and that's potato. Um, most of the people there do research on tree fruit press. There are a couple of us that are lucky enough to be assigned to both projects, and I am one of those. Um, so I do research on a pest of pear, uh, pear scylla, and a pest of potato. Potato psyllid. So, what are psyllids? Let's talk about psyllids for a couple of minutes. Uh, psyllids belong to a super family, actually. It's eight families of uh, insects. Um, they are very small. So, let me get the pointer right. Uh, this is a fifth end star. It's blue in color, which means it's almost an adult, maybe about another day. So, uh, an adult's not much bigger than that. This one's on a penny, so that's Abraham Lincoln's face. Um, they are, for the most part, host specific So Paracilla only feeds on pear. Uh, many of the other, they, they're, they're very host specific Potato psyllid is the, probably the exception to that. They feed on um, all solanaceous crops. So potato, tomato, eggplant, uh, peppers, uh, all the nightshades. And we're coming to find out that they might feed on other families as well, like sweet potato and things like that. Um, just like aphids, they feed on the phloem. So, um, now they are small, but they are, whoops, 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 wrong one. Okay, they are small, but they are bigger than plant cells, so, you know, don't, uh, <laughs> that's my, my non-artistic uh, abilities there. But, um, for, for demonstration purposes, uh, just like aphids, they, um, they have piercing, sucking mouth parts that travel uh, intercellularly uh, through the plant tissues, so they tap into the phloem. From there, we assume that they basically do the same things that aphids do. They uh, salivate for a while, and uh, in that saliva are a bunch of proteins that hijack the plant's physiology, uh, keep the phloem from plugging up so that it keeps open. Uh, the proteins uh, probably counter plant defenses so that they can stay attached to the phloem and feed for long periods of time. Um, let's see. So there are uh, some psyllids that are agricultural pests, which is why, as an ARS researcher, we're interested in them. Um, just the other day, um, on uh, CBS with Brian Williams, they were talking about the citrus psyllid and the citrus green disease, and they interviewed some ARS scientists about that. Uh, it's a, a big problem right now in Florida and, and possibly now in California as well. It's, it's, uh, the, this beer vector species that the insect spreads just outright kills um, citrus. Uh, there's also a carrot psylla that uh, is a vector for another beer vector species. And then the two that I work on, potato psylla, which is a vector of a plant disease, and then pear psylla, uh, which is a pest of pear. So the potato psylla, vector of uh, beer vector, it causes zebra chip disease. Uh, well, for the most part, the zebra chip disease um, it will kill the above ground portions of the plant. Uh, and so it will spread through an entire potato field and, and the whole thing will have to be abandoned, which is of course a, a major problem if you're a grower. Um, if the, the tubers, if the plant does live long enough to produce tubers, the tubers have these stripe patterns in them. Uh, when they are fried to make chips or fries, uh, it becomes much more noticeable. 
Uh, you've probably seen some potato chips like this or french fries like that. Uh, they're not harmful, but they do taste really bad, um, and they're really just not marketable. So um, it's a pretty serious disease. It's actually only recently been recognized. Uh, they only first recognized a disease in the 1990s, at, uh, in first in Mexico, uh, and then it's since spread to the United States. And then in 2011, we found it up here in the Pacific Northwest, um, just very recently. And uh, we grow more than 50% of the potatoes here in Oregon and Washington and Idaho. So uh, it's a huge concern to the growers up here. Um, and so that's a big reason why we're doing research on it now. Um, just in the last couple of years, the story has gotten much more interesting because we found the potato psyllids uh, are actually made up of several different haplotypes. And so they, we, per, we named the haplotypes based on where they were first identified from. So the western haplotype was first identified in California. The central seems to be from Texas. The northwestern has only been found here in Washington State. And the southwestern comes from down around uh, New Mexico and Colorado. And so we, we identified these haplotypes based on the mitochondrial gene CO1. Uh, but there are phenotypic differences that are also associated with these uh, different haplotypes. So, for example, the northwestern haplotype is the only haplotype we have found so far overwintering here in the Pacific Northwest. It appears to be much more cold-hearted than the other haplotypes, and it overwinters on this bittersweet nightshade. The other haplotypes we don't find on bittersweet nightshade. Uh, they're not cold-hardy. They don't uh, overwinter here. Uh, the western and the central, they seem to annually migrate up to the Pacific Northwest. Uh, we find them here in the summer, and then when the temperatures start getting cold, they disappear. Uh, Another interesting thing about this, a uh, postdoc in our lab, um, uh, she, she sequenced uh, CO1 and found that actually Northwestern's, the, this 500 base pair region differs by about 3.5% from the, the Western and the Central haplotypes, which is uh, a lot of variation. So, um, so we have divergent haplotypes in the Paracella, very different types of uh, pest. Uh, it is a vector of a phytoplasma. Uh, but we control this disease with um, resistant rootstock, so it's really not that big of an issue. Uh, instead, what the nymphs do is they produce this abundant honeydew. You can see in this, uh, in this picture these drops of honeydew. Uh, they produce a huge amount of this. And it's very, very sticky. It's uh, a medium for the growth of city mold, which causes fruit russeting and, and fruit downgrading. Uh, so um, you get an economic loss there. But one of the biggest problems, at least talking to a lot of growers that I've talked to, is uh, the increased labor costs during harvest. So since it's so pick, uh, so sticky, you have to pay the pickers so much more money to, to be willing to come and pick the pears. And this sounds petty, but when we count these, when we count the nymphs, we have these metal, big metal counters, and it's so sticky that you know it starts to stick to your fingers and lift up off the table. So it's, it's really quite annoying. So uh, the forceps stick to you. And, um, so anyway, it, it is a, a serious problem. So, okay, so now let's talk about psyllids and bacterial symbiotes. So, historically, for the most part, we've always thought of a psyllid as a psyllid. So, if a psyllid population uh, builds resistance to insecticides, for example, we've always thought, well, it's because it has a gene in it that makes it resistant to the insecticide, which is true a lot of the times. But, it's becoming more evident that when you take a closer look, the psyllid is, is you know, also made up, the phenotype is also expressed from the endosymbiotes, that is the bacteria that are living inside of the insect. And so if we group the different types of endosymbiotes, there's first of all, there's the obligate symbiote. So this, this guy, they're, they're buddies, they, they <laughs> give a thumbs up there. So, um, uh, so you know, this, this would be a, a friend, and, and I'm going to talk about all these in, in a lot more detail. But they're also facultative endosymbiotes. And unlike the obligate <laughs> symbiote, they're not present in all psyllids. They can be present in some psyllid populations and not in others. Some of these, uh, some of these are, are friendly. You know, they actually provide some benefit to the psyllid. Uh, others, like Wolbachia that I'm going to talk about later, uh, they can manipulate the psyllid's biology for its own benefit. Uh, maybe not necessarily beneficial, but rather a little more selfish. And then along the similar lines of uh, being selfish, you have the insect vector plant pathogens. That sometimes they can also alter the insect biology, uh, but these are really just trying to hitch a ride to the next host plant so that it can reproduce. And so um, 
why do we care as uh, entomologists? Well, in order to control an insect, in order to control any insect, especially without using just normal calendar insecticide sprays, which we want to move away from, uh, you need to have a good understanding of the insect biology and ecology. And it's becoming much more apparent that the insect ecology and biology very much depends on the symbiotes that are inside of the insect. Uh, and so, in order to understand the ecology, we need to understand what's there. Uh, also, from a more applied perspective, if we can find ways to target the symbiotes, we can come up with novel ways to control the psyllid. So if we kill carcinella, the psyllid can't live without carcinella. So if we, kill, if we target carcinella, we found a new, uh, new way to um, target psyllid populations. And also, if we can directly, you know, basically prohibit the psyllid from picking up the uh, uh, bacteria, prevent the bacteria from moving from the mid gut into the insect, um, then the psyllid's not a problem. If it doesn't vector the uh, pathogen, it's, it's, we don't need to worry about it. And so um, that's kind of what a lot of my research is uh, moving towards. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through these different, these three groups, the advocate symbiotes, the facultative symbiotes, and the, uh, the, 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 the uh, pathogens. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about them, what we know about them. And then I'll talk a little bit about some of the research that we're doing at the Agriculture, Yakima Agricultural Research Laboratory on these different groups of uh, symbiotes. So I'll talk about uh, Carcinella first, the obligate symbiote. So uh, Carcinella, it's, it's a, an obligate association. So Carcinella can't live without the psyllid, and the psyllid cannot live without Carcinella. Uh, there's a very close co-evolutionary relationship between Carcinella and the psyllid. So uh, this figure um, shows phylogenetic uh, relationships between different psyllid species, and this one shows the phylogenetic relationships between the Carcinella uh, that are inside of those uh, insect species. And it follows a very similar pattern. I mean, they match up very well. And in fact, uh, I, d I don't know who has done this or whether it's been published, but my understanding is that if you take Carcinella from any of these and move them to another psyllid species, it doesn't match. They, they basically reject it. And so so it, it seems like, you know, each Carcinella strain is specific to a psyllid species. <clears throat> so what is the relationship here? Well, psyllids feed on phloem, as I mentioned earlier, and phloem is, is really lacking in essential amino acids. It's, it's really poor in essential amino acids. So, Carcinella, it has a very small genome, very reduced genome, but 18% of that genome, that's a huge proportion, is devoted to the, uh, devoted to the, uh, the, the production of amino acids. Um, and in fact, Carcinella can, has genes to produce all the biologically relevant amino acids. However, Carcinella lacks the genes for its own essential biological processes. So the psyllids provide Carcinella with the proteins that it needs to, to basically be a bacteria. Uh, so hence, psyllids can't live without Carcinella, Carcinella can't live without psyllids. In fact, this relationship is so important, the psyllids have an organ that, that only exists to harbor Carcinella. And it's called a bacterium. And so when you dissect a psyllid, there's this very large orange mass in the abdomen. These are trachea that are, are supplying air to the bacterium. Uh, this bacterium is made of bacteriocytes, which are fairly large cells. The, the space there is the, the, the nucleus of each cell. Uh, this picture we have um, labeled Carcinella with a fluorescent probe so that we can see it. Uh, and so you can see Carcinella inside of all of these bacteriocytes. So Carcinella is residing inside of these cells um, of, of the bacterium. Uh, in fact, there are a lot of researchers that are trying to make the, or making the, a good case that uh, this process that we're seeing with Carcinella with a reduced genome, uh, its uh, uh, association with the inside the cell are basically the first steps toward um, the evolution of organelles. In other words, mitochondria and chloroplasts probably went through some of these same stages that uh, uh, Carcinella seems to be going through right now. So, um, so an interesting association. So we aren't doing a whole lot of research yet on Carcinella. I've been there about two years. Uh, most of my research has been on plant defenses so far. Okay, 
But we have found that there are certain classes of defenses that are effective against pathogens. They, they are very effective against uh, plant bacterial pathogens. They also reduce the performance of parasol. Um, they, they, reduce, they, they basically kill the nymphs. Uh, they are also effective against aphids, which are flow and feeding insects, very similar to psyllids. They also have their own symbiote called Bucnera that's very similar to Parsonella. And so it's not clear why defenses against pathogens are effective against these flow and feeding insects, uh, unless you take into account that perhaps these defenses are indirectly affecting psyllids and aphids uh, by, by reducing the populations of Carcinella. And so uh, right now I'm working actually with an ex a student that was a um, person who was a student here at CWU. Uh, and we're working on a uh, quantitative real-time PCR assay to actually look at this to see if these defenses, these plant defenses are reducing carcinella populations and therefore um, uh, killing uh, the psyllids. Uh, and that's, that's about all we're doing right now with carcinella. But now I'm going to talk about facultative endosome. Is, I'm doing a lot more research on facultative endosymbiotes. So again, these are symbiotes that might be present in some populations, not in others. Um, uh, it's not an obligate association. So first, I uh, just want to talk about um, facultative endosymbiotes in other insects. So uh, in other insects, there are there is Wolbachia and uh, Cardinium, which cause reproductive manipulations. I'm going to talk about them in a little bit. Uh, in aphids in particular, there are some endosymbiotes that seem to confer resistance to insecticides. So populations with these endosymbiotes are, are more resistant to certain classes of insecticides. Same with plant defenses. There are some populations of aphids that have these, uh, certain symbiotes that um, are uh, virulent to plant defenses. And then uh, there are others that offer protection against natural enemies, some that can increase or decrease cold hardiness. Uh, and then there are others that actually kind of do the same sort of thing that carcinella does, maybe not quite as effective, but um, they produce essential amino acids for the insect. So what about psyllids? What do we know about endosymbiotes and psyllids? Well, we don't really know a whole lot, because there really hasn't been very much research done on it yet. Um, there is an unidentified symbiote in an invasive psyllid in California that protects it against parasitoids. And it's, it's kind of a neat relationship. You, you look at where it's located in California, and basically the, the parasitoids just can't get a handle on, on these psyllids where the, the symbiote is present. Um, we don't know what symbiote it is. It hasn't really been identified yet, but uh, it, it seems to be an association there anyway. Uh, and then Wolbachia has been discovered in potato psyllid and the citrus psyllid. And before I started working on it, that's about as far as it's gotten. Uh, although the last um, three or four months, we've, we've made a lot of headway on that, as I'll discuss here. So, uh, Wolbachia, by far the most well-studied symbol of insects. Uh, it's, it's the, the amount of literature on Wolbachia is, is overwhelming. But um, very little on psyllids. But uh, it's well known that Wolbachia causes reproductive manipulations in insects. It's, Wolbachia is widespread in insects, um, but uh, some of these reproduction, reproductive manipulations that it causes uh, include male killing, where um, infected males die. So uh, it basically it's thought to give the infected females uh, a better chance, more resources available to uh, survive. Uh, and some insects, it causes feminization, where infected males develop as females, Whoops, let me go back. Uh, it can also uh, cause parthenogenesis, where infected females reproduce without males, and so all of their offspring are more infected females. Uh, and then the most well-known reproductive uh, uh, manipulation caused by Wolbachia is uh, cytoplasmic uh, incompatibility, which is the inability for uninfected females to reproduce with infected males. And so all of these reproductive manipulations are basically, they favor reproduction by infected females. So since Wolbachia is maternally inherited, if there are uh, more infected females in the population, then there's more Wolbachia in the population there as well. <clears throat> and then there's some debate over this, and uh, it, it's somewhat of a hot debate on whether uh, these, these uh, reproductive manipulations promote evolution of insects. 
whether they uh, can, can drive speciation of new insects. And there's some empirical evidence that suggests that that could be the case. Uh, it is um, still a, a debate, though. Cytoplasmic incompatibility, again, the most widely studied form, the most widely studied reproductive manipulation caused by Wolbachia. It's also caused by Cardinium. New research is showing there's another bacteria out there that, that does similar things. It's not as widespread. Uh, but unidirectional incompatibility happens uh, when a non infected female is unable to produce viable eggs when mated with a, an infected male. It's, it's unidirectional because mated or in, uh, infected females are able to um, reproduce just fine with infected or non-infected males. Bidirectional incompatibility happens when different strains of Wolbachia are involved. So in this case, a female uh, infected with strain A can reproduce with a male infected with strain A, but not with a male infected with strain B, and uh, the, the same way. So uh, unidirectional Cytoplasmic incompatibility, there's a lot of theoretical models that suggest, yes, it could divide populations and lead to the divergence of populations, but very little empirical evidence. Bidirectional, it's a lot more, it's, it's much more accepted that bidirectional incompatibility could uh, uh, lead to uh, divergence of insect populations. But it's still debated. So. Okay, well, Blechia doesn't only cause reproductive uh, manipulations. It can also cause other extended phenotypes. So in fruit flies, it's been shown that uh, Wolbachia infection can alter the insect's uh, uh, olfactory uh, reception. And this includes both to, to host plants that will just not recognize a, uh, a host plant as a host plant based on its volumes. Um, and it will also uh, change their response to, to sex pheromones. They apparently can uh, tell the difference between female or um, uh, mates affected with a different strain. So uh, this has all been done on fruit flies. Uh, there is some Evidence also that, uh, well, whoops, keep it in room, but, uh, feeding uh, uh, macrolophus uh, and uh, antibiotics to kill the endosymbiotes, including Wolbachia, increases its supercooling capacity. Whether this is because of Wolbachia or something else that they killed and didn't know um, is, is still a debate. But, but there, there, it seems to be that Wolbachia can also uh, express other extended phenotypes in the solids. Okay, so what about Wolbachia mutatis? This is, for, for students here, this first little part of the story, there's, if you don't remember anything about Wolbachia, the, the bottom line here is, if you get results that don't make sense uh, and, and, and they're confusing to you, don't just give up on it, find out why, because either one, there's something flawed with your uh, experimental design, or two, you found a really cool discovery that you need to, to, to figure out what's going on. So uh, there was a graduate student in our lab that was doing studies on the biology of these different habitats. And this is all brand new, so it was really exciting research. Uh, he wanted to see what happens when haplotypes mate. So he did an inter haploid mating study. And he found that most of the crosses, the, the egg survival was you know, around 90%, between uh, 80 and 90%. But all of his crosses with the northwestern female and western males and the northwestern females and central males. All those eggs died, and he thought maybe it was thrips, and he, he kept trying different things, and then um, they showed the data to me, and I said, well, it looks like Wolbachia. So um, we took all the DNA that he used to, to haplotype the different cells he used in these, and we screened them using PCR for Wolbachia, and as expected, we found western haplotype was infected with Wolbachia, the central haplotype was infected with Wolbachia, but the northwestern haplotype is not infected with Wolbachia. And so, this fits our pattern of unidirectional cytoplasmic incompatibility very nice. So a uh, northwestern female that is not infected with Wolbachia cannot uh, reproduce with a male, either the central or the western, that is infected with Wolbachia. But these were all colony insects. So didn't put a whole lot of weight on that. Maybe it was just something happened in our colony and, and uh, uh, caused the northwestern to uh, become not infected with Wolbachia. So, went to a uh, postdoc uh, at our laboratory who has discovered all these different habitats. And she has uh, collections going all the way back to 2005. These were insects, wild insects collected from the field uh, from all over the country. We found that we were able to detect Wolbachia in most of the western habitat insects and all of the central habitats, 
but none of the northwestern hapatite. So it appears that this, this association between hapatite and Wolbachia is, is a real thing. Uh, the southwestern hapatite, we really don't know very much about the southwestern hapatite. We don't have it in culture. Uh, we don't have very many insects. It's, it's really uncommon, and, and we're trying to find more so we can do more research on it. Found two bands in the southwestern hapatite. They were very faint. We had to play with the, the uh, contrast and brightness quite a bit just to be able to see them. Uh, we're excising those. We're going to try to clone them to confirm that it's Wolbachi. We haven't done that yet. So I have a question mark there because I kind of suspect that maybe it's, it might be something else. But, um, but still, it was only two of them, so it doesn't appear to be in the southwestern population either. So basically what we have is a northwestern hapatite with a very different uh, mitochondrial sequence. Uh, there's not infected with Wolbachia, and we have central and western that are infected with Wolbachia, and a huge divergence between them, at least in uh, CO1 sequence. As it turns out, this really isn't that uncommon. Uh, when we looked at the central and western haplotypes, um, we, uh, we actually found that they were doubly infected with two different strains. So the uh, gray marks, it doesn't really matter. These are just the, uh, the sequence of uh, uh, the WSP gene. Uh, big difference between the different strains, so they're doubly infected. So, which kind of is also interesting since Western and Central are doubly infected with Wolbachia and Northwestern not at all. Okay, so what we would expect, since the geographic regions of these haplotypes overlap, we get Central and Western that migrate to the Pacific Northwest. Presumably they can intermix. Uh, since the infected status gives a reproductive advantage to the infected haplotypes. We would expect that infection to just uh, spread through the northwestern population very quickly. And since both Wolbachia and uh, mitochondria are materially inherited, we would also expect for the northwestern haplotype to disappear. And we could say the same thing about the southwest, but I'm not including this because we don't know much about that haplotype. That's not what we see, though. We see an association between mitochondrial haplotypes and Wolbachia. And this association, at least so far, appears to be stable. Uh, and again, it's, it's not unheard of. Um, there are a couple of reasons why this might be. Uh, one is there could just be very low migration rates of the infected haplotypes in the Pacific Northwest. So it takes about a 20% threshold for the uh, Wolbachia to basically go through a population and infect them. Uh, if we're below that, then maybe Northwestern could remain its own separate habitat and, and non-infected. Uh, I'm not sure how likely this is because these, the western habitat in particular is so easy to collect in the summer up in this region. Uh, and in fact, it's much more common in potato fields than the northwestern habitat. Uh, but perhaps. Another maybe more interesting uh, scenario might be that uh, this represents um, uh, a historical hybridization between potato psyllid and uh, a closely related psyllid species. So in this scenario, there would be an ancestral mitochondrial haplotype, Zobachia free, probably pretty close to the northwestern haplotype. At some point, males from this uh, haplotype mated with a closely related psyllid haplotype with a different mitochondrial uh, sequence that happened to be infected with Zobachia. And then those offspring gave rise to the western and central uh, mitochondrial haplotypes that are infected with Wolbachia. If this were the case, then somewhere out there, there is, would be a uh, closely related uh, psyllid species that is also infected with Wolbachia that would have a similar mitochondrial haplotype to the western and central. So, and they think that this is the case in uh, uh, another insect system. I don't remember which, but um, uh, so this might be something we need to look at a little closer. Uh, another reason why this association between the mitochondrial haplotype and Wolbachia infection might exist is a process of reinforcement. So this is all theoretical studies, uh, theoretical models, and I don't even pretend to, to understand the math because I'm kind of math illiterate. But um, basically the, the gist of those models are that when you have a mainland population that is affected with Wolbachia, that with uh, individuals that are migrating to these island populations, uh, an island population that does not have Wolbachia can maintain its local adaptations, I guess, better than an island population that is, is infected with Wolbachia. Uh, and so you, this, this association between 
between you know, basically local adaptations and Wolbachia infection remains stable. Um, again, it's theoretical models. There's no empirical evidence to suggest this um, unless we consider maybe what we think we have with potato cell, where we have these, what we call them mainland populations in California, mainland populations in Texas that are infected with Wolbachia with annual migration to a much smaller uh, island population here in the Pacific Northwest. We know the Northwest population is locally adapted here. It uses a host plant much more readily than the other haplotypes. Um, so you know, maybe it's it's a combination of Wolbachia plus local adaptations that are keeping these uh, this association between the mitochondria and, and Wolbachia infection uh, stable. And finally, um, perhaps Wolbachia is causing other extended phenotypes that are further isolating uh, these populations. So uh, if Wolbachia is causing differences in, in olfactory cues, for example, the use of bittersweet nightshade by western and central haplotypes, uh, or changing the cold hardiness, uh, perhaps Wolbachia infected so it's just aren't cold hardy so they don't survive the winter. So we end up with our, our uh, local population staying here during the winter and surviving. Uh, we have no idea which of these uh, might be contributing to this, uh, this association, but they're actually not mutually exclusive. It could be a little bit of all of them. Uh, and so this is, this is kind of research we're going to be heading off into in, in, in the future, is trying to, to look at this a little bit more, so we can get a better understanding of the habitat specific ecology. So, but why do we care? So from a fly perspective, basically all this is telling us the potato silage in the Pacific Northwest is not a homogeneous group. So in other words, if we go out and we find a trap in a potato field with a potato silage on it, that does not necessarily mean that it's a threat for the bacteria. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's time to spray. Uh, and although that's exactly what we do now. So, um, so the more we understand about this, the better I think we're going to be able to control uh, potato silage here in the Pacific Northwest, uh, the more we understand the, the difference in the habitats. Okay, so I'm going to move on now to talk about some other symbiotes. So, Wolbachia appears to be important in habitat biology. Uh, but what else is there? Uh, well, unfortunately, we don't know. So, how do we do this? Uh, we use universal primers to, uh, uh, to amplify 16S. Uh, from all the endosymbiotes that are found in psyllids, we cut them out of a gel. That gel might contain DNA from a bunch of different symbiotes. We clone those into a vector. Unfortunately, these symbiotes, we can't grow them on a plate. They're, they're not culturable. But E. coli is. So we take those 16S genes, we clone them into E. coli, we grow them out, separate them, sequence them, and then we're able to identify what's there. And we're in the process of doing that preliminary studies. We've, we've done some on paracilla and potato cilla. Find all the usual suspects, what we should, Liberobacter, Wolbachia. Uh, Pseudomonas keeps popping up. I think it's probably just... Uh, uh, it's just uh, uh, contamination, but um, it, it pops up a lot, and so, uh, you know, I, I don't know, some people say that it might actually do something to the insect, but, but uh, that's questionable. Uh, Arsenophonus, uh, again, this is all preliminary, it really needs to be um, confirmed, but that's uh, a, a bacteria that causes reproductive uh, manipulations in other insects, parasitoids in particular. Never been found in a phloma feeder, as far as I know, so, um, this is something we'll take a look at a little closer. And in fact, we are doing that, um, but we're going to take this to a much larger scale. We'll look at the differences in these endosymbiotes among the, the uh, at least the three different appetites that we have here in the Pacific Northwest and, and probably the Southwestern as well. Paracilla, uh, we're, we're in the process of doing this. I started out with a small study taking looking at populations in the three uh, primary production regions here uh, in the Pacific Northwest being up in the Wenatchee area, the Yakima area, and Hood River Valley. Uh, I've since um, made this a much larger study and much more expensive, but uh, much more complete as well, including a uh, production region uh, in southern Oregon, the, the Sacramento Valley in California. And this is where 90% of our pears are, are, are grown. And then uh, close to where I went to college and worked with ARS as an undergraduate student uh, in Kernesville, West Virginia, uh, trying to get solos from there too. And so what I hope is that uh, by this research we'll get a comprehensive list of, of the endosymbiotes in both potato psilla and pear psilla, uh, be able to identify variations in the symbiotes uh, among the different psilla populations, again, both potato psilla and pear psilla. 
And that, in turn, will provide the foundation and tools to conduct further research on silicon microbe interactions. And uh, you know, that's about as far as I've gotten on that. But what, what other research am I talking about? Well, first of all, what are the ecological implications of symbiotization of psyllids? What do these symbiotes do to the psyllid, uh, if anything? And one, or, or two, uh, can we manipulate those bacteria to uh, control psyllids? And uh, our solution to both of those, very excited about it, is the CRISPR-Cas system. Uh, this is basically, uh, takes advantage of uh, bacterial immune system. We can design CRISPR RNAs to target DNA and bacteria. And then the, basically the bacteria attacks its own DNA, so it, it commits suicide. So far, all the symbiote work done on any insect has all been done with, with uh, antibiotics, which are not selective. If you try to get rid of Wolbachia with, it, uh, with uh, antibiotics, you get rid of other stuff in there as well. So you might say, well, this has to do with Wolbachia, but how do you know you're not killing something else? So uh, with this CRISPR system, once it's up and going, hopefully by the end of the summer, uh, we'll be able to target just Wolbachia or just Porcoponus or anything else that we might find. And then this might also have some applied aspects too. Everyone talks about RNAi as being uh, perhaps turning into new ways to control insects and control diseases. Uh, I think probably the CRISPR-Cas system, which is fairly new, is, is probably uh, a better system than RNAi to, uh, for, for applied purposes anyway. So uh, this, this is going to be really exciting in a couple of years. Hopefully I'll have some really exciting stuff to tell people. Right now I'm just, it's kind of a wish list. So. Okay, so um, the last group I'm going to talk about, psyllid vector uh, uh, plant pathogens. So um, uh, basically what I'm going to talk about is Liberobacter and potato psyllid because that's what all my research is on. But a lot of this research um, also has uh, applications with the citrus green disease um, that's, that's spread by the, the Asian citrus psyllid. In fact, I'm hoping to work, some of the folk, work with some of the folks down in um, Florida since our, our systems are so similar. Um, so since the potato psyllid has only been associated with Liberobacter since about 2007, so basically the acquisition, uh, process of, of acquisition and transmission of Liberobacter by potato psyllid, there's nothing known. And, and most of the research done on this has come out of our labs um, the agriculture research lab down there. Uh, so we've been doing a lot of this research. And my contribution to this research has been the use of fluorescence in situ hybridization to uh, detect where Liberobacter is in the insects. And so uh, through this process, uh, dissect uh, adults or nymphs, uh, remove the uh, reproductive organs, the bacterium, the gut, uh, do hemolymph smears with the fat body, and then also dissect out the salivary glands. Uh, and then uh, basically, wash them with a uh, fluorescent probe that binds specifically to Liberobacter. So then we rinse away all the unbound uh, fluorescent probe, uh, we get a green fluorescence where Liberobacter is located. It's been a great tool to be able to track Liberobacter through the insect, um, and, and we've learned a lot using this technique. One of the first things I did was um, just to find out where Liberobacter is located in the insect, because we, we didn't know before. And so, uh, long story short, it's found everywhere. It was found everywhere we looked anyway. So uh, this top picture shows a uh, gut. This is the mid-gut loop of, uh, of a psyllid. And the green shows uh, where, where Liberobacter is located in the gut. And of course, we would expect this because it picks it up by feeding on affected tissues. And so it has to be in the gut. Uh, B shows uh, a hemolymph smear. And the green spots show Liberobacter that was just present in the hemolymph, which is the insect's blood. Uh, both C and D are salivary glands. The blue shows the boundary of the salivary gland. The green shows Liberobacter infection. So uh, C, I would call it heavily uh, infected. I would call D probably early stages of salivary gland infection. Then both E and F are bacteriums. So it's found in between the bacteriocytes. So Carcinella, you can see the, the shaded areas. That's, that, those are the bacteriocytes. That's where Carcinella is. Uh, Liberobacter is found all around those cells, but in that organ, in the bacterium organ. And so, in, in, I think we're the first people to show a, a, a plant or an insect vector plant pathogen inhabiting the bacterium. And, and so, it's kind of interesting. So, although we found it everywhere, it wasn't necessarily evenly distributed in the insect. 
Uh, not surprisingly, it was most often found in the gut. Adults, about 66% of adults that were reared on infected potato plants um, had Liberia back in their gut. Uh, only 40% had infected salivary glands and 40% had infected bacteria. NIMS, somewhat different story. About the same amount had infected uh, elementary canals, but only 10% had infected salivary glands and even fewer had infected bacteria. So the general thought uh, is that, Liber or that uh, the psyllids transmit Liberobacter when they salivate. So when they tap into the phloem, and they start discharging saliva into the phloem, that's when Liberobacter is being spread from the insect to, uh, to, the, uh, to the plant. What we didn't know before we started doing this is whether they are just regurgitating from the gut or whether it's actually coming from the salivary glands. Uh, this made us think that perhaps if it's coming from the salivary glands, then the adults would be more infected than nymphs. And so we put this to the test. We, we uh, reared nymphs and adults the same way, just continuously reared on infected plants. And indeed, we found that adults, nearly 60% 60 of adults, uh, transmitted Liberia back to the plants. Those plants got sick and died. Uh, only 20% of nymphs did. And this was a, a highly significant difference. And this matches our data somewhat nicely. Um, this process doesn't, we're not able to detect it from everybody, so uh, you know the, the, the rates are probably higher than 40%. But uh, the, uh, the patterns follow pretty nicely that, that, that uh, uh, adults are more infected than nymphs, perhaps because they're more likely to have infected salivary glands. So we wanted to look at this a little closer. We took adults uh, that were not infected with like Liberobacter, and we put them on uh, infected potato plants for 24 hours. And then we moved them to sweet potato plants. And sweet potato is not a host for Liberobacter. So the only time they could have come in contact with Liberobacter is when they were put on the infected potato for 24 hours. And then uh, it, immediately after, and then for the next couple of weeks, we dissected insects, removed them, dissected them, and uh, to see where Liberobacter was located. Um, it was found in the gut pretty much evenly from week zero all the way to week three. Uh, really no, no, no change there. However, uh, the probability of the salivary glands being affected increased with increasing time after that exposure. So we did PCR, the same, same study setup, did PCR on whole insects, found that the PCR titers were basically the same through that whole week. Uh, these are different acquisition and access periods, but for the most part, the, uh, it, it stayed the same. Um, however, when we take those insects and we transfer them to potato to see if they are able to infect new potato plants, that only occurred after two weeks. Which, so suggesting that, you know, um, basically providing evidence for what everyone assumed without any empirical evidence, and that is that the mode of transmission of Liberobacter is propagative, circulative, and persistent mode of transmission. So the insect picks Liberobacter up by feeding. The, uh, the uh, pathogen moves through the gut of the uh, insect into the hemolymph. It propagates, reproduces, uh, infects the salivary glands, and only then, after two weeks, it is able to uh, infect new host plants. One really interesting thing about this, it might just be a complete coincidence, is that it also appears that Liberobacter alters psyllid settling, settling behavior. So this comes from um, a postdoc a couple of years ago, uh, or a year ago, uh, that worked in the lab under Dave Horton. Uh, at first, this is just looking at the settling behavior of adults. They first gravitate to infected potatoes. They ignore the non-infected potatoes. They don't ignore them, but they, they, they are far more common on infected, infected potatoes. After about two weeks, they all move. This is an arena style, so all the plants are on there. After two weeks, which is about the same time that it takes them to become infected, or the salivary glands to become infected, they move from those infected potato plants to the non-infected potato plants. And we don't, we, we can't separate plant effects. It might be because the plant's getting sick and they sense that. Or it might be that the bacteria is actually doing something to the insect to alter its behavior. Uh, either way, it's an interesting association. Uh, and when you look at the total number of eggs in these arena-style uh, assays, there are far more eggs on the non-infected plants than they are on the infected plants. So it's almost like they move these plants, they pick up Liberobacter, and then for some reason move the non-infected plants to spread. 
So kind of a neat interaction that we should probably look at a little closer. Okay, so uh, what's next? Um, this associate this uh, uh, infection of the bacteriums uh, could be potentially really important. It could be completely incidental as well. So it's something that uh, I want to look at a little closer. Uh, does this infection with the bacterium, does it set up interactions with other endosymbiotes that are present in there, including carcinella? Um, and if it does, you know what kind of associations we're talking about. Uh, it can also facilitate transovarial transmission. So most of these symbiotes are transmitted from, from mother to egg uh, transovarially, and that appears to happen straight from the bacterium uh, into uh, the developing oocytes. Uh, and that's certainly the way it happens with uh, uh, carcinella. And so uh, there are some reports that are still questionable we need to do a little bit more work on. So Liberobacter is uh, transverally transmitted uh, so that eggs come, eggs from an infected female might also be infected with eggs. Uh, and so one thing that you might want to look at is whether there's uh, an association between uh, infection of the bacterium and transverial transmission. And then also, more importantly, from an applied standpoint, what factors prevent Liberia bacter from infecting psyllids? Uh, are there uh, host plant resistance? Are there differences in feeding behavior that might uh, decrease the chance of them picking up Liberia bacter? Or are there physiological barriers in the insect? So maybe uh, insect immune responses. Uh, one of the best, more promising ways that I think to look at this is to try to determine why the nymphs are less likely to harbor Liberia bacter outside of the gut. Uh, than our adults. So it appears that the, uh, the nymphs are just immune to Liberia bacter somehow. So um, um, this is all research that you know, we'll be moving on to here in the future. And then research that we are moving into now is looking at the overwintering biology of the Northwestern haplotype, um, which is actually why I'm here, because I was learning to use an OS monitor from Jason. Uh, uh, part of this overwintering biology uh, is to try to determine whether or not um, Liberia bacter overwinters here. So far, we have not found it overwintering here. We have not found any overwintering psyllids affected with Liberia bacter. Uh, so, you know, is the insect more cold hardy than Liberia bacter? Um, who knows? So this is, this is research that hopefully we're, we're, we need to find out, hopefully in the next uh, uh, happy year year. So, um, so to go back to the original question, microbes, psyllids and microbes, are they friends or foes? Uh, a little bit of both. So uh, there are certainly some that uh, get along quite well with psyllids and uh, others that are perhaps selfish, like Wolbachia and uh, plant, vector, plant pathogens. So hopefully um, you guys found this interesting. Uh, you know, I, I'm not going to go through everyone here, but, uh, you know, I, <laughs> there are, in both my lab uh, and my colleague's lab, Dave Horton and uh, Joe Mernieza, uh, we all have undergraduate students that work in there. And so, um, uh, if there are undergraduate students or, or anybody that is looking for a job in the summer, we are far away, we're all the way down in Wapato, but if you live in Yakima uh, and you're looking to get experience in the lab, drop your CV off at the front desk. I can almost guarantee that one of the nine of us is going to give you a call if we're always looking for help. And uh, that's kind of how I started in the ARS, was working as a student in Kearneysville, West Virginia, and, and that led to graduate school and me coming back to the ARS. So uh, anyway, um, so that's just food for thought. But um, if you're more interested in uh, other research that's done at the ARS, um, you can go to our website. Uh, there's actually a really cool uh, science in your shopping cart. It talks about how all the science for the ARS is. You, know, you won't look at what you buy the same anymore. Uh, and then there's uh, this, this uh, I think it's quarterly agricultural research. It's, it's available as a PDF. The last version had uh, an article about the research I've done with Liberia vector uh, and the first sensor hybridization. And so they have a lot of really neat articles in there from ARS all over the country. And so there's some pretty neat stuff in there. But um, with that, I'm going to quit Gavin. And uh, are there any uh, questions?